Hey everybody, welcome to Profiling Evil by Mike King. It's Profiling Evil Live today. I wanted to take a few minutes and touch on a couple of cases, but first I want to just shout, shout out to uh, a few folks. It looks like people are starting to pile in now. Um, Barb Nauman, great to see you. Sam Costa, thanks. Tony Harris, uh, great to see you. Uh, Andrea Watkins, thanks. Mimi J2, thank you. Miss Sophia, thank you. To uh, my my moderators, thank you so much for keeping things uh, held together. Uh, it's going to be fun to watch the chats. I think you're going to enjoy today's guest, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, two cases that are kind of important right now. Uh, Tony Harris, nice to meet you. Uh, thanks for being on. Uh, and uh, Rebecca Davis, uh, Road Lizard, CU McGuire, uh, uh, Michelle Leonardo, uh, uh, Mina Bodbot, uh, Modbot, <laughs> Veronica Zarek, thanks. Uh, folks, for those of you who uh, were on choir practice Monday night, uh, we, we were doing some profiling of some cases. We were talking about Randy Leach and uh, what's going on there. Just so you're aware, uh, Adventures with Purpose is out right now. Uh, looking at this site, we wanted to revisit. I hope that they recover a body today. And if so, we'll uh, put something up on that. I, I may even go live with them if they if they do that. But I uh, had uh, some communication with them this morning, and uh, they're uh, zoning in and, and hopefully uh, searching that site for a body, which will bring closure to a, a two-year-old uh, homicide, which is uh, pretty nice uh, if we can if we can do that. Um, this this is kind of important uh, today because the Dante Lucas trial is is resuming, and uh, if you remember, it has been on a little bit of a hiatus. Uh, Lucas is charged with the murder of Kelsey Schelling, and uh, and if you remember Kelsey, this little gal on February third of twenty thirteen, eight years ago, just a couple of days ago, uh, learned that she was pregnant. And uh, she desperately wanted to have the father of her unborn child involved in the process. Uh, apparently, uh, the father, Dante Lucas, uh, had enough control of her that he convinces her to make a two-hour drive from Denver, Colorado to the suburb or to uh, Pueblo, Colorado, where he's living. She did it after working a full day of work and leaves at 10 o'clock at night because he promises her a, quote, surprise. Well, the surprise was something uh, happened. She disappeared the following day. She hasn't been found in eight years. Imagine that. That little baby would have been seven and a half years old uh, by now. She was declared dead by prosecutors who filed murder charges against Lucas and are now in the beginning days of this uh, circumstantial evidence trial. And I keep making a big deal out of this because it is important. If you think about the Suzanne Morphew case, it, in my opinion, will become a circumstantial case. This requires an incredible amount of courage from a prosecutor to charge a case like that. Um, two weeks ago, coronavirus struck the courtroom, and of course, the trial was postponed for two weeks. I hope you'll take some time and explore the story map that I've built on the Dante Lucas case. And I, I want to just pull that up real quickly here. Uh, in that, uh, in that, a story map, you're going to be able to go through and catch up on everything that's going to be covered in the case. You'll learn about who Kelsey is. You'll uh, be able to go through and uh, figure out the locations. You're going to be able to, to learn a little more about the cell phone tracking that went on. And uh, I actually cover some information on that. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to go in and look at some things like uh, Dante buying or using her uh, card to go to the ATM and get money and then dumping her car off later. So I hope you'll go through that. Remember, these maps are interactive. You can go in and work on those, move around, explore those. You'll be able to, to watch the content uh, like here, this content of Dante pulling in and, and getting money out of uh, the ATM. And of course, uh, I also put in a section here where you can go in and see what's happening in the courtroom. Now, uh, just keep in mind, this, this is going to be really hard hitting. Uh, and if you think about the opening statements of the prosecutor, I think those were pretty impressive. 
the prosecutor started right off the bat by saying, folks, this is a homicide case, not a missing person case. And she alleges that Lucas lured shelling to Pueblo, used manipulation and control. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, she disappears, which is really interesting. Again, go back, review the case. I can't help but think that this is going to be really important as we look at circumstantial cases uh, that we see around uh, the block. But right now, I want to shift attention and bring in my special guest, Mike Watkiss. Uh, Mike, how are you today? Good. It's great to be with you, and it's great to see you and hear you again. It's been a long oh, time. It has been a long time. I uh, I, I was so excited when uh, this morning you, you agreed to jump on with such short notice. I wanted to talk about Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, a little bit. And uh, folks, uh, I just... I just want you to know that Mike is an internationally known reporter, author, actor, and uh, gosh, a friend of mine for the past 30 years. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, Mike, maybe you could just tell everyone a little bit about where your career took you through the years, because you've worked in major markets. You've reported on some of the biggest cases that have happened in history. You even have worked for... Um, organizations like a current affair and other uh, of the more uh, non-traditional news media. <laughs> that's tell nice, everybody. That's a nice way to say it. Thank you, Mikey. I've been, uh, I, I tell people, I think I'm the luckiest guy in the world because I really, and I, I mean that so sincerely because I've had the, uh, I've been lucky enough serendipitously to have been at the right place at the right time for some fairly significant historic moments. And you and I crossed paths a long time ago covering a, a, a well-known sort of cult leader in Utah, Arvind Shreve, you know, and, and, and it's been, it's been one story like that after another. Uh, uh, I started in Utah, I grew up in Salt Lake City, hometown kid, and just uh, started in media there and uh, have been on the road pretty much uh, for the last 40 years. It's, it's amazing. When I look back, I, I think I remember um, seeing you at a crime conference about, I don't know, five years ago, we both were keynote speakers for the conference. And, and uh, we, we had the chance to talk together about how the media and law enforcement can work together. But I mean, you, you handled some biggies. You, you, I remember seeing you with some stories on September 11, uh, Princess right. Diana, and, uh, and one that I, paid a lot of attention to Oklahoma city bomber. What, what were some things that jumped out at you during those? Well, I mean, again, just, uh, I feel fortunate to have been a witness to history. We did, we got on a first flight over and covered princess Diana's uh, death and funeral, uh, in Oklahoma city, you know, shortly after the bombing and therefore tra tracing McVeigh's steps, uh, as he led up to it, did a fairly uh, lengthy piece on that. Uh, and, you know, it was there the morning they found the bodies of Ron and Nicole starting the O.J. Simpson saga. We were working in Los Angeles at the time, and you know, interviewing Richard Ramirez, ambushing Elizabeth Taylor on an airplane. Uh, just, uh, you know, it has been sort of a, a crazy, uh, uh, you know, uh, one story to the next, but it has been uh, as fascinating. And some of this, some of the stuff I try to write in the book, if it makes any sense, and I, I'm not certain it does, but piecing all of these, these random, seemingly random events that sort of became my world. Yeah. And you, and you do have a couple of books out. What are those books? Mike? The, 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 I've got one I'm working on. And, uh, but the one I've got out now is called story hustler, murder, mayhem, PTSD. And Story Hustler is a, uh, is a, you'll, in the book, I explain where that name came from. Uh, a woman uh, was writing a book about Michael uh, Jackson, and there's more to the story, but she refers to me in the book as a story hustler. I don't think she meant it as a compliment, but I loved the title so much that I wanted to put it on business cards. And then I retired and I figured, well, it's perfect handle for my book. <laughs> That's great. I, I, the, the PTSD part, is that the PTSD that you suffered having to do all these cases or is it part of the topic? Well, it's a, 
the the book as if you if you read the book the, the uh, it opens up and sort of the premise of the book uh, a man called me 20 years ago mike uh, out of the blue very nice fella obviously a devoted fan a follower and and watcher of the station i was on and he he sincerely asked me if he thought i suffered post traumatic stress disorder and honestly i had never thought about it but you know you and you and i had shown up at the same scenes enough time to know that uh, does it take a toll on one? I, I, I you know, uh, and I don't want to diminish anybody who uh, who has you know PTSD or to to insinuate that uh, that uh, I'm a victim of anything because I'm not. I chose to do every. I ran into every one of the scenes I I covered and willing. I would have done it if I wasn't paid. I'm just wired that way. You're probably wired that way. Most first responders uh, who I admire a great deal. And I spent, I spent my career covering first responders in many ways. So, you know, I mean, I, I'm rambling now, but it's uh, the, the, the bottom line is uh, I, I've been lucky and I've just been able to, to uh, be at some scenes and tell some stories that I think, uh, you know, not because I was there, but just because they, they intrinsically were of great significance historically. The war and well, and that, you know, that whole saga. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was just going to bring up is uh, you, you've you also had quite a few films that you've appeared in, you've helped in the direction of, or you've written pieces or parts, uh, maybe even whole, w one specifically on Jeff's. I mean, why don't you talk yeah, about that? Yeah, me? well, I, I think that if uh, if there's a part of my career that, you know, if there's something that took up more of my career than anything else, it was really the pursuit of the wrongdoing of Warren Jeffs and his followers in the FLDS community. I grew up in Utah, you know, you know it too. And if you're, if you're there, you have some sense about the, what these communities are like, what's going on inside them. And, and, uh, and so we, I started telling some of the stories about the abuses of women and children 40 years ago. And I, early on, and, and Arvind Shreve was, uh, you know, obviously a smaller version of the Warren Jeff story. And so all of this, uh, you know, it, it, it seemed, I kept thinking that if we expose the wrongdoings, law, law enforcement and politicians will step in and do the right thing. And with the exception of a handful of guys like you, not many did. And it took a long time to beat the drum and uh, expose the, you know, it really was, we, we went out and found the victims, got their stories, confronted the perpetrators, put it on television, and then hoped that somebody would act, and it just took a really sort of depressingly long time for that to happen, for any real justice to be meted out. And I think you guys did, in, in Utah, did a better job than we did here in Arizona, to be honest. Oh, well, you know, that's that's kind to say. I, I, I don't know. Folk, folks, I'm talking to to uh, Mike Watkiss, a three-decade reporter, maybe longer, Mike, I don't know, but I've, I've known you for 30 years, and yeah. uh, um, Mike has worked in major markets in Los Angeles, uh, Salt Lake City, Phoenix. He's worked for Current Affair. He's been around the world uh, on news stories, and, uh, and we met during the Zion Society case years ago and have been able to, from time to time, keep in contact, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, Jeff's for a minute, because uh, as you know, I, um, after leaving uh, the local law enforcement and going to the attorney general's office, I took over that ritual crime task force for uh, the attorney general in the Utah legislature, which put me in front of those polygamous groups on a regular basis. And we had a program called Safe at Home. I don't know if you remember that under I Attorney remember. General Graham. And uh, it was such a great Trojan horse because we would talk to the polygamous leaders and say, well, you know, obviously you want everyone to feel safe at home, don't you? Let us come in and educate people how they can report if they're ever being abused. Well, it put, it put them right on their heels because they had to appear to be participating in helping law enforcement. Right but they wanted to keep their secrets safe. And, and I went through Colorado city and Hilldale and, uh, and over into Centennial park, actually two weeks ago, uh. I just wanted to drive around and get a sense. And, uh, and, uh, you know, of course there's still such an influence there, but I don't think anyone, uh, that has never been into those communities would understand the feeling you have as you pull into those and the white truck starts following you. You want to talk about that at all? 
Well, you know, I always found that really interesting because I had so many dealings with these guys over the years that uh, by the end, but after a few, uh, you know, after me going up there, I couldn't find any of those guys. I, I see other reports going up and they show the video of them getting harassed. I went up there and I couldn't find anybody to talk to. The cops hid. Uh, you know, the thing about it was we kept going back. And when when one a young reporter or somebody new to the story drop in there, you know they get intimidated. Or, but uh, those guys were a bunch of blowhard bullies. And once you started calling them out, none of them would come out in the street. So it, 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 really, for the last decade, I was covering that story. I had to go chase into buildings to find somebody official to talk to because I couldn't get it. even even the the God Squad or any of those thugs to come out and hassle because they just didn't want to mess with us, I guess, anymore. Uh, and and really, it is because we knew the question and the follow-up question, and the follow-up question. Because you know, they're the layers of secrecy. You go and ask these guys what you're doing, and they've got their line. But if you know the truth and know some of the evidence, then you can ask them the follow-up question. And the fo- and that sort of put them on their heels. Uh, you know, I was, I was just looking at a, a memory in, in some social media about going back and covering a, a, a Senate hearing, the one time the U.S. Senate took up the issue of, of crimes being committed in polygamous communities, Harry Reid from Nevada, and uh, holding the, and uh, during this, Willie Jessup, the famous enforcer for war, and Jessup was there, and Willie and I almost got into a fist fight right outside a Senate hearing one day when he came out and started accusing me of kidnapping people. So, uh, you know, it, it, hey, it, and those it, Jessup boys were big boys. Yeah. They're, they're, <laughs> Yeah. So anyhow, uh, but uh, I belly bumped with most of those guys at some point or another, you know, getting chesty with those guys. And uh, but uh, we, you know, it was it was gratifying because you were up there, even though the 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 uh, the legacy of the FLDS community is still strong uh, up in Short Creek. Uh, it the chain the community has changed a great deal. And and it's much more open. And and in many ways, I think we had, you know, I like to think we had some hand in chasing Warren down into that Texas prison cell he now sits. And also in uh, in the federal lawsuit that was very significant about three years ago when they basically took the whole town to court here in Phoenix and uh, and uh, took away the powers of the police force and the powers of the cult to control the the utilities and the water and all of that. And, and that has really made it proof. And then the fact that a lot of people who are not FLDS who got thrown out are coming back and buying. It's, it's changed. And I, I would like to think we had a small hand in that. Yeah, no, I, I think it has changed uh, quite dramatically. You, you don't feel as intimidated in there, even yeah. you know, walking in the grocery store. A tough guy like you didn't feel intimidated down there. <laughs> Well, I uh, always had friends close by, I, I guess. I always, a, but... I always had a real big cameraman with me, too. Just... <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, um, folks, I'm talking to Mike Watkiss, a longtime reporter and friend, and we're talking a little bit about some of the cases that Mike has worked. And I wanted to, to kind of uh, transition over, Mike, and talk yeah. a little bit about Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. Uh-huh. And... Uh, Later, we'll be uh, posting this story map online uh, for you to be able to go through, folks. But uh, and and it may be up there already at profilingevil.com forward slash story maps. But uh, um, Mike is one of the few people, and, and I can now say I fall in that group, that actually interviewed and sat with Richard Ramirez. And uh, I don't know, it's something to be proud of, Mike, but it's something that is memorable and you'll never forget. What were your impressions the when you first met Ramirez? Uh, well, the, the, the setups. So I got to know him through some of his groupies, uh, the fun. women who were uh, in love with Richard. And there's a whole... Uh, uh, Passel of them fighting with each other to go see Richard when he was being held in San Francisco following the LA Marathon trial, and uh, women, uh, including a porn star and a stripper, and you know, and a woman who was on his jury in LA, were all infatuated with him, and they were getting into fights to see him. So uh, we heard about this. Figured that's we that's a, that's a current affair story. These girls are a current. Affair. 
<laughs> we went up and uh, I got acquainted and we, long and the short of it is I got to know Richard through one of these young women. And uh, we sat down and did an interview in a tiny little cubicle where, uh, I don't know, the spatial arrangement, but he was, you know, he was three feet in front of me across a little metal table and we were in this little box together and it was a lively 45 minutes. You, you know, I, I, I'd like your impression. One thing I've said, and I actually have had some people uh, unnerved by the fact that I would even say it, but n- number one, I described Richard as being uh, very polite, uh, kind of charismatic. But the thing that I really sensed, and, and the way I sensed this was this little story I'll share with you. I, we uh, met over some prison lasagna and we sat down afterward and we were getting ready to talk and we walked into the room and I, I said, well, Richard, have a, have a seat. And I pointed to the table and he said, oh, no, sir, I, uh, you sit first. And I said, oh, no, no, no. I said, I'm, I'm uh, the visitor, please, I insist. And, and then his whole demeanor changed and he said, no, I insist, you sit first. And I and so I did dutifully. I sat down and uh, let him become the instructor while I was the student, which uh, made him open up. But Good. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, my interaction with Richard was probably, and I've said this, I write extensively about uh, in the book Story Hustler, uh, my interaction with Richard and the lead up with these young women. But uh, my interaction with, I think, could you could call contentious. I had, uh, before we, he agreed to do the interview, but before I was going to go in and talk to him, I really felt like I needed to, to the extent I could, immerse myself in what he had done. So I went and found one of his victims, a man that he had shot in the head three times during a home invasion, then he uh, brutally raped and uh, savaged the, this young man's then fiance and uh, so and he was uh, the, the the guy uh the uh, the uh, the fellow that richard had attacked was a wonderful guy but left profoundly disabled after being shot three times in the head uh, that was carnes then yeah it was it was bill carnes and uh and yeah. so i went and uh, i went and spent an afternoon with bill and uh, you're gonna get me you're going to get me going here. Uh, I went and spent an afternoon with Bill uh, at this group home he lived in for people with traumatic brain injuries. And his Two of his nieces, little cute little girls, came over to see him that day, uh, That with the day that we were interviewing Bill. And to watch this man who was, again, shot a couple of times in the head and it was, you know, uh, had, was paralyzed on one side and struggling just to stand and to see this guy endeavor to push his two young nieces on a swing set just because he as his their uncle he wanted to be the wild and crazy uncle bill and to see this man you know and to see how his life had been impacted by Ramirez so I went in having gone through that and I will confess to you and I say this in the book that it was not my best interview because I went in sort of a little ticked and wanted to mix it up and Richard uh, immediately tried to start pulling the same sort of stuff I think it sounds like he pulled with you and uh, he had a, he had a whole sheet of bullet points that he just whatever I was going to ask he was going to read so uh, you know and I was already maybe a little hot at that point and uh, we were there face to face and uh, so we let it fly and again, I uh, may be sitting back and letting him talk. I've done other killer uh, interviews with killers, a number of them since then. And you're, I think getting out of the way is probably the best thing. But Richard was going to just talk, make, do a few talking points. And I figured if I was going to get him off that, I sort of had to rock him. And so we tried to. And it was, uh, it was a lively uh, couple of minutes. Uh, well, I'll tell you, I thought the interview was great. And I appreciate you allowing yourself to to show some emotion right now, Mike, because I think that's one of the things that drew me to you during the Zion Society case, when you saw those little kids and what they had endured. Uh, and it's probably the reason why I uh, invested so much in your stories at that time. So thanks for being that way. Well, and, and there was a hand, like I say, I, I think the failure on the part of Arizona and Utah to do anything significant about this over decades has been, has been profound, but there have been a handful of people who have stood up when, when it was not popular and nobody really seemed to be care about the damn thing. And you were one of them early on. And so, uh, yeah, I just want you to know, I appreciate that because there was, 
there's there's stories that you, most stories you do is like uh, this was one that, as we were discussing earlier, just seemed to be fairly, fairly defined, black and white, good and bad, and and praying, you know, systematically praying on on women and children was a bad thing, and that's what had, was had, got, had started it was happening inside these closed uh, communities like the Zion Society and down in the Short Creek. And so I appreciate the fact that you had the guts to stand up and do it when it was not popular on your end either. <laughs> Well, you know, it was, it's interesting. I, I, uh, you were able to get something that I didn't want out. And that was the video of the, uh, women and children modeling lingerie. And, you know, thankfully we were, you were careful and, and we didn't expose, uh, many of the children, especially the most young children. But, uh, I, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this about, uh, three months ago, I was invited to go over and do Dr. Phil's show. And All right. he, had, he had gotten word about the case and yeah. he brought in these kids who are now 45 years old. And uh, it's the first time I'd seen him in 30 years. And, and prominently part of what he played was the current affair video yeah. segments <laughs> and, and, and that one. But uh, it was a really emotional moment for me to see those kids. Yeah, and I, I hope they're doing well. I mean, they all they all went through a lot. And, uh, they they are doing very well, uh, considering what they've had to deal with, and one in particular, Amber, actually calls you out by name often because I think you did a follow up story with Amber uh, years later, and uh, is and, uh, I don't know if you, she ever told you about her Raggedy Ann story, but if you get a minute, go to the um, profiling evil page and look up. Uh, Amber and Raggedy Ann, because we actually, uh, 30 years later, got her a Raggedy Ann doll and oh, delivered it to her home. Her. Yeah, she's so, a, a nice young woman. I have a yeah. Raggedy doll in the living room. Okay. Okay. Your son remembers that? My son is uh, my son is uh, saying we have uh, Andy has uh, some uh, Raggedy Ann dolls in the living room. Oh. So, I will go listen, go grab them and listen to the story from Amber. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so let's, let's jump back to night stalker for a minute. I wanted to just show the story map that I've created on stalker and uh, get your uh, thoughts on a few things as we go through it. Um, and we'll just kind of chat a little bit and folks uh, make sure you get over and look at that. I don't, I don't know if we ever talked about this much. In fact, I'm sure we didn't Mike, because I hadn't made the connection, but uh, the author of the Night Stalker, uh, Phil Carlo, was also a longtime friend of mine. And, oh, and uh, right? if you remember, Phil, Phil was actually uh, the uh, best man for Richard's in prison wedding when he uh, married one of those women who chased him for years and years. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was hoping I was going to get invited to that wedding, but I unfortunately I was not. <laughs> well, when people go through this and when you go through it, uh, the, it'll be kind of a walk down memory lane. And in there, it will cover, uh, this covers Richard's life. It talks about, I spent some time talking about the influence that his uncle had on him yeah. and uh, his uncle's obsession with uh, women during the Vietnam War that he brutalized and murdered. Yeah, and, I mean, in many ways, the, uh, the uncle was a serial killer long before Richard was. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And I wondered with many of Richard's victims that were Asian, how much of that uh, went back to that kind of prepubescent time in Richard's life when all of a sudden he was really attracted to, to uh, Asian Watch, women. Watching the, uh, the documentary on uh, the same thought crossed my mind too. What was the, what was the fixation? Yeah. You know, I asked him about that and he wouldn't talk. And I think we saw something similar. And I actually have your uh, interview at the end of this story map. But I, I pressed Richard a little bit. And of course, every time I did, he would then say, well, number one, I'm not a serial killer. And number two, I don't want to impact my appeal that's going on, which he was right. constantly in appeals. Right. Uh, but you could at times, and I saw it happen in your interview, you could see uh, the animal inside start to stir and want to get out. 
Well, and you see, and I, I share your uh, your assessment of Richard in many ways because I think I think you do him a disservice if you think, don't recognize that he was quite a bright young man. I think he was yeah, tr- intrinsically pretty. He probably had a pretty high IQ. Uh, you know, the the damage in his childhood was just profound. Uh, the the influence of the uncle and a horrible uh, does that ex- in any way excuse? No, of course it doesn't. But I think it's it, to to have a, a richer understanding. Uh, a more, uh, you know, helpful understanding. It, it, you should note these things, and you're right. He was. I mean, the, the fact that these women were literally thrown that, that courtroom, that freak show of a trial in Los Angeles. You know, half of them were women blowing him kisses in the in the gallery. So, uh, he, undeniable uh, charisma for you know. He became sort of the first uh, rock star. Uh, uh, rock star serial killer, uh, with uh, you know that the brand that he uh, sort of developed with the help of the media, willing media, but uh, but uh, undeniable. I think he was smart. He was charismatic, very conniving, and there's no question about it. And there was uh, uh, he was, as you said, controlled. I don't think uh, he was not about to talk about anything personal about him. He wanted to talk. About Satanism. He wanted to talk about the nature of evil. He wanted to talk about these heady concepts that he'd obviously read too much about, and then you know, and thought about too much with uh, too much idle time on his hands. But uh, those were the things. But he didn't want. You know, there was nothing about revealing himself. Richard wanted anything to do with, and I think that that was very planned and very calculated. Yeah, he he was extremely controlled. And I want to share with you in just a minute, one moment when he actually gave up. But as you go through this story map, you're actually going to be able to see each of the homicides that were committed, including Carnes. You'll see the evidence that actually became very impactful. These are really cool, these story maps. I just really enjoy uh, using them to help ter- tell a story because you can go in and really explore things. You can, uh, if you if you're interested, like you you want to see which homicides occurred in Monterey Park, you can just get right down to the to the nitty gritty and really explore things. So I'm hoping, folks, that you'll take advantage of this. And and I might mention while I'm doing this, uh, I'm seeing some of your comments rolling in. We got the back office running full steam today. So if you have some questions for Mike uh, or for me. Uh, get get them in there. You're you're uh, more than welcome to put those in, and and we'll try to answer some of those as we go along. But uh, I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to bounce through. This covers all of his murders. It covers his arrest, and uh, includes some of that uh, really not very often talked about or seen imagery of him actually getting put in the police car after he got tuned up by that group and thank goodness they did but here's something i wanted to just throw out and see what your thoughts were um uh, mike and that is i went i went through as part of my studies on him over the years and i looked at how he started ramping up as time went on and i don't know if you've ever even paid close attention to this but uh, tell me what your thoughts are does we see um, a lot of people think that killers get better as time goes on and in some cases they do they perfect their craft But Ramirez, uh, like many, was becoming really disorganized, and we start seeing him really ramp up things. But I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I and I think that uh, you know when you start to add in dimensions of sort of frenzy and sexual, whatever. I mean, just the uh, predatory. Yeah, he made. He definitely started making mistakes. Uh, But uh, and and you know, and who knows if we know the full. I was. uh, I noted one of his attorneys from Los Angeles was interviewed in the Netflix thing. And he says, you know, I clearly Richard has spoken to this guy and, and he, he uh, throws out this sort of loaded statement that there's probably a lot more stuff that we'll never know about, you know, and, and I would think that's probably true. I don't think that, you know, a guy like that comes out of nowhere. Uh, and it is, I think it is certainly an escalation. I don't think many people drop into being, you know, a home invader, shooting people in the head, tying up and raping them on your first rodeo. Could it happen? I'm sure it has. But uh, but I think that somebody like Ramirez uh, started off with uh, Petty. I mean, they, they talked about that he was a, a known uh, thief as a child. I mean, clearly he was, he was sort 
of violating the law and outside, you know, their sort of parameters of right and wrong early. And I think it becomes easier and easier and easier once you sort of have crossed that. that not everybody goes to the extent, but a, a guy like Ramirez, he, he was a tailor made to uh, to end up where he was, where he. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, given again, given the backstory and everything, and this is in no way an excuse, but uh, but again, I find it fascinating. Uh, the the Netflix film, and I tell, I'm interested in what you think about that. I thought it was fascinating, and I'm glad they focused on those two extraordinary cops. They did a great job, and then Gill and uh, and Frank, uh, you know, really extraordinary law officers. Uh, but but uh, like my interview, and it sounds like your interview, I thought the the Netflix. Uh, left something to be desired in in sort of revealing Richard, but I yeah, don't. I kind of felt that way. I don't. I don't know if any of none of us. I, I don't think Richard wanted to be revealed. You know, though, I wondered. I wondered why they didn't talk with his wife or uh, some of the retired staff from the prison who actually talked to him. Um, you know, uh, Phil uh, Phil Carlo obviously now is deceased and not able to, but guys like Don Denevi who were, you know, Dr. Denevi worked with him day in and day out. Yeah, and I um, wonder they didn't want to, maybe they didn't want to, I mean, the wife may not have wanted to participate or, you know, who knows? Who knows? They would, yeah. uh, it'd be interesting perspectives. Well, I want to play just a segment of your, your um, interview and then, uh, we'll we'll drive people to um, either go to the web and, and hunt you down, or they can go to the story map and watch it. Uh, you also have a YouTube channel that they could subscribe to. Um, so I, I I know you don't do a lot in that environment, but um, but they can. Is there other ways that they can learn more about your background? Well, you know what I think. Uh, the the book is available on Amazon. It's uh, again, it's Story Hustler. Murder, mayhem, PTSD, and uh, headed out for about nine months now. It's done pretty well, and uh, it really there's a lot about Jeff's. There's a lot about uh, there's a lot about Richard. One of the longer pieces, chapters, uh, is about Richard Ramirez, uh, and uh, and then uh, you know what? Having been on television and in front of a camera for as long as I have, unfortunately, there is incriminating evidence all over the internet. So, yes, there is. Although yeah. you may not recognize him folks because he actually used to be pretty clean shaven. Yeah. This is, I've, I've been retired as we were discussing and it. Uh, I started uh, sort of growing uh, whatever. I uh, started growing my hair out a little bit for a, a role I was doing. And then the, uh, the pandemic hit and I've, you know, and now I'm just sort of a, just sort of a disheveled old man sitting on his patio writing books. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, you, you are as brilliant as ever. And, uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, again, I'll ask if folks, if you have any specific questions, uh, please pop them up. But what I wanted to do is just play a segment of this. Uh, I'll preface it with just telling you at one point in my interviews with Richard, uh, I pressed him a little bit and I was going through homicides, but I wasn't I was going through his homicides, but I was talking more about the behaviors in each of those series. And I finally stopped and I said, Richard, what were you thinking then? And, you know, I thought I could trip him up and it just, there was no tripping him up, but he said, well, number one, I can't talk about, you know, again, what's it's being appealed, but he said, based on what I've read about serial killers, this is what I've learned they would do. And then he started to expose his inner side and uh, it was uh, chilling. It was uh, intriguing and direct, uh, but that was the only moment. And he went on for about three or four minutes and then he caught himself and, uh, and then he went right back to, you know, government kills more people than serial killers do and all of that the stuff. Gave me too. It was one of his favorite lines. He loved that. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. Well, let me play this because I just thought uh, the interview was just fantastic. So let's uh, go into that and uh, just listen to Richard Ramirez and Mike Watkiss for just a moment. You admit to being evil, Richard? We are all evil in some form or another. Are we not? Convicted serial killer Richard Ramirez seemed to relish the concept of evil. Once upon a time, a lot of folks in the state of California viewed the one-time Texas altar boy as evil's human embodiment. Yes, I am evil. 
not 100%, but I am evil. In the summer of 1985, the Texas drifter descended like a deadly disease on a hot California night. A one-man epidemic of madness and murder, one of America's first serial killers to be given a brand name, the name the Night Stalker. Lock your doors, lock your windows. If you have the ability to provide additional security devices, then by all means do so. Who wants to be next? I don't. No one else does. He preyed on both women and men, young and old. He slipped through windows, slit throats, raped, tortured, and killed. What he did to me has been the total destruction of my life and my girlfriend's life. Former computer engineer Bill Carnes, one of Ramirez's many victims. One night, Carnes and his girlfriend were assaulted in their bed. The woman was raped and Bill Carnes shot three times in the head. Bill Carnes ended up in a group home with a bullet still lodged in his brain. Wow. Well, um, folks, make sure you check out the story map. Uh, Mike, what are your thoughts there? Uh, memory lane memory lane uh it's just so many years ago and uh and thinking about the rippling effects of what he did you know uh, you talk about victims decades afterward and uh there i i have a neighbor who was a, 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 a apparently a child in southern california when this is a, and people still come up to me and say how, how utterly traumatic that moment was and and it was one of those kind of things this guy was the i i refer to him as the omnivore predator he he ate any he would go after anything uh, little children boys girls uh, adults uh, there was uh, women men uh various types of, of slaughter and and uh, and abuse and torture and uh, so it was he, this guy really brought a whole uh, you know tool chest of uh, he was the omnivore. He uh, there was nothing that he did was he was a predator that went after everything, and yeah. that's what terrified people and it took and took these uh, took these atrocities in right into people's bedrooms, and so obviously it was an unnerving moment. You look back on it, just uh, the trauma that one guy like that can inflict on 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 dozens of families in an entire community. It's it's incredible, uh, Mike. I don't know if you can see this question from Sue Deplices. Uh, did they? find all of his victims that were killed by him or is there still outstanding missing victims to be found and uh, that must be identified uh, it kind of goes to something you were answering but maybe you could comment on that yeah i to my understanding i mean everybody all of the homicides that richard is believed to have committed is known to have committed uh, you know, those are all accounted for. But uh, again, there was, a, you know, I think with a, a guy like Ramirez, he didn't, he was doing stuff before he came up on the radar screen. And, uh, and Gil and Frank uh, and their detective work in Los Angeles put together, I think, you know, the body of his, his criminal work. But uh, are there things that they are unknown? Are there victim people, that, uh, people that were killed perhaps by Ramirez that we will never know about? I, I wouldn't bet against that. Yeah, it, it doesn't make sense when you see the, the way a serial killer and the amount of cooling off period between events it doesn't make sense that there would be the big spaces that we see, um, especially from his first attempt when he's a young man working in the motel in El Paso and uh, frankly gets tuned up by the husband who captures him in the house or in, right. the, in the motel room through to go year and a half, two years until that first assault. Uh, retired Sergeant Melinda asks about any mental illness. And I can say that um, there were attempts to say that he was mentally ill and, and the court and the prosecution were able to rule that he was competent to stand trial. And that was something that I always would make sure I brought out in cases that I testified in on these kinds of cases was that, uh, in my opinion, is he goofy because he does this? Absolutely. But he knew what society standards were and he chose to violate them anyway. Yeah. And that's proof by the way he hides out. I would have real trouble uh with uh, with an allegation or an argument that Richard was uh, in again ma mental illness, and I'm certainly no expert, but uh, he was aware of what he was doing and knew yeah. uh, the nature of what he was doing. And uh, is that grounds for culpability? I would say so. 
you know, I think it's interesting when you, when you look back at his period of time and you see this happen with serial killers, there's almost a level of uh, arrogance and boredom that comes with this thing. Uh, but the one traffic officer who stopped him and uh, he's got him standing out in front of his car while he's running a license check on him. If you remember, yeah. uh, Ramirez drew a pentagram on the hood of the car uh, as the officer was getting over the air uh, that, that he's a suspect in a serial killing. And uh, then he takes off running. And uh, well, actually, I, th I think he had just I think a child had just been assaulted or some crime had just occurred. So it was going out on the radios and uh, Ramirez gets pulled over uh, uh in a, I think a stolen vehicle, and the the cops writing him has him has his hands on top of the roof, and uh, Richard hears the call for the the assault he had just committed, and re I'm in trouble, so he runs and leaves his fingerprints in all likelihood on top of the hood of that car, but this is one of those times where law enforcement did not do the right thing, and uh, one agency didn't help the other agency out, and they had this this vehicle that had uh, Ramirez in it and perhaps his prints and, uh, and it got thrown into a storage lot for weeks and weeks. And, uh, and uh, they probably could have uh, uh, prevented some of these uh, killings from occurring had, you know, the, the, the law enforcement followed through, but uh, unfortunately they didn't on this one. Yeah. Amazing. I had uh, a friend of mine uh, on a few weeks ago, talking about Ramirez briefly as we were introducing just a thing I call the public record, which is just a reminder that Netflix story was out and uh, he's a retired profiler. And uh, I, I said, well, one of the things I found interesting, Richard did relate to me that the first pentagram he drew uh, was actually out of boredom and it got such uh, emotion out of people that it then became his moniker. Yeah, you know, I, I think in my it, Richard uh, was. Uh, I, I don't think Richard was adverse to shocking. He wanted to make a scene. He, he and a, 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 a good dose of theatricality in the young man as well. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and uh, and he played it. No doubt, he played it. So uh, Robin S asks, "What kind of serial killer is he? Since he doesn't have a target victim." And, you know, that's probably one that's more up my alley, but I'd like you to take a stab at that, Mike. But my thought is, Robin, that first and foremost, I don't know that it, he didn't have preferential victims. I believe he did. Right. But like many uh, killers that become disorganized, if their preferential victim is no longer available, they'll pick a substitute, something easy to replace with because they still want to have that thrill in his case of assault and dominion and control and ultimately uh, taking of a life. So I, I don't know that I would be one who would say he didn't have a preferential victim. I don't know. What are your thoughts, Mike? Well, I, I think, uh, I think you're right on all of those matters. Uh, you know, he, he definitely had a, a certain group, a demographic that, uh, uh, seem to make up a, a large portion of his victims. So, uh, to that extent, but, uh, but you're right. I think most serial killers, you know, the, the, uh, probably the most, uh, uh, the one I've heard the most of is, is the, is, uh, someone preying on, on vulnerable women who are pros, uh, you know, on streets. Those are, the, the, there's so, I've covered so many serial killers where that's the demographic because the target's easy. Uh, you know, and uh, you're right. Most serial killers follow some sort of uh, sort of uh, mo, uh, and that's I think one of the interesting things about Ramirez. He he definitely did not, and I think it was startling to uh, to Gill and Frank when they were uh, investigating the case as the Netflix doc. You know, suddenly they had some guy who was breaking the rules, and <laughs> yeah. they had to rethink things. And and Richard required that. Yeah, you know, actually, and, and what, what I learned after studying him <clears throat> was that uh, there were two things happening. One was fantasy driven, and I believe that was the actual victim selection process that sometimes was frustrated because we see him originally start going after women that are in pretty much a similar kind of capability or a category. But 
uh, these killers are also functional. They gotta they gotta pay for drugs or they gotta pay for their rent or or whatever else. So right. all of it became also how do I also satisfy this need, but also get some money or get the drugs I need or other kinds of things. Right, right. And Richard, uh, Richard successfully navigated that by just robbing people when he broke into their homes and shot them and raped them, and then yeah. took all their land, took all their loot and jewelry. <laughs> Mike, will you come back, spend some time with me, and we'll do do some more shows? Anytime, Mike. It's just, it's just honestly, just seeing you again after all of these years and uh, reminiscing about some of the old days. It's been fun. Well, it's. Uh, I got. Let's see. If, I don't know if you can see on the back shelf. Let me grab it. You know, this is one thing about age. My eyesight. It... <laughs> oh, let's see. Wait a minute. My chair's hung up. Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, I got to get your address so I can send you this out. That's uh, that's the new book. Oh, I can't wait. And, you know, I really, I, I'm so interested, having been there back in the days for the Zion Society and Arbor Street, I can't wait to uh, read your perspective on all that. Well, and I thought you'd be interested in one thing here, uh, just a, a little look down memory lane. I don't know if you can see that, but that's that's some of the kids. Oh my goodness! Yeah, wow. So, oh, so uh, get me get me your address, uh, sit tw tw uh, and and I'll send you the, a book out. And I expect uh, to have a book in return. Folks, we're going to list Mike's book down below so that you can get the link and go right to that and order it. And uh, Mike will get you back because there are so many stories that are wrapped up inside that head of yours that you covered over the years that I think you could add such a remarkable insight to. And I'm just really grateful to have spent time with you today. Well, I'm just grateful that we're still friends after all these years, Mike. That's good enough for me, brother. Hey, do you know how fun this was for me to actually be the one interviewing you? Well, I know we, we turned the tables and I, <laughs> I, I apologized earlier. If I was a little rougher, uh, there were times when I could be, as you saw in the Ramirez, I could be sort of a, not that pleasant. So I'm hoping I wasn't too big a jerk. Never were. I always enjoyed working with you. So folks, l let me just end by saying, go, go look up Mike Watkins. Look at his amazing career. Watch some of the stories that he did. Uh, make sure, look up, uh, go on to YouTube and look up Zion Society Current Affair and uh, catch up on that. Uh, I, I Gosh, we were just young boys at the time, Mike. It's just so fun to, to and think you, back on yeah. all that. Oh, what's that? You still look young. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the beauty of a baby face. And I still have a job. I'm on my lunch hour, so we're going to wrap. Uh, but as soon as my lunch or as soon as my job days of working end, who knows? I might even let two or three days of, of face hair grow out. Come on. As soon as you retire, come down and sit on the patio here in uh, Phoenix with me. It's nice. <laughs> I'd like that. Well, folks, have a great day uh, from Profiling Evil. Thank you so much to my dear friend, Mike Watkins. Thanks so much for your years of service in keeping things in front of the public. If we learned anything in the last couple of years is the importance of the media, even when it's a little uncomfortable, to yeah. expose and keep things in front where we can really make decisions based on all of the information. So thanks a lot. Have a great day. And we'll see you soon on Profiling Evil.